everyone hits a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. Welcome to another episode of Bump in the Road. The basic podcast is always free. We also have a premium subscription called Bump 2 that lets you listen in on extended behind-the-scenes conversations with our guests. Check it out at www.bumpintheroad.us. Chris Dahlbredeen is also known as At Shots From Above, his Instagram handle, where he shares his exquisite photography with the world. Chris flies a trike, an open motorized aerial vehicle. With a range of several hundred miles, he can explore from his home base in Taos, New Mexico, into Colorado and southern Utah. What motivates one to pursue such a unique way of making a living? A bump in the road, of course. Welcome. And Chris, tell us your story. So uh, I moved to Taos, New Mexico when I was just turned 20 um, with a, with a, just an obsession and love for skiing and wanting to learn how to ski. And um, I was just always so enthralled by anything that gave me the sense of flying, whether it was skiing or surfing or any kind of anything where you just felt kind of free from the bounds of the, the bound bonds of gravity, you know? And um, so so I had always thought about flying since I was a kid. I wanted to be a pilot. And uh, and when I was 13 in Silver City, I uh, went up for a flight with a local pilot And uh, because I was writing a paper on what I wanted to do when I grew up. I wanted to be a pilot. And so so I went up with, with this man. He was a great, great pilot, old guy. And it was a really rough day. The air was, you know, in New Mexico, the air gets really rough because of the uh, – it's the atmosphere here. So it was an amazing experience, but I actually got sick because I, I got motion sickness. And uh, so I came down and I just felt really discouraged because I thought maybe I wasn't cut out to be a pilot. And so I kind of put it, you know, put the dream on the back burner for a long time and just thought, well, you know, I, I can't fly if I'm going to get, get air sick. And but I kept seeing, you know, hang gliders and these other ways of flying that, you know, I wanted to be, I wanted to experience flying with, you know, ideally with nothing, just, just, just me out there flying. And when I realized, you know, I had dreams as a kid flying, as a lot of people do, just flying with your arms or whatever, flying through space and flying over the earth and just seeing incredible visions of the earth from above. Um, as long as I can remember, I had those those really vivid dreams I was and when I woke up I just feel so happy and and just so alive from the dream and so I just kept kept in the back of my mind that I really wanted to learn to fly and uh for many years skiing was kind of you know great substitute for flying because it's and skiing and fresh powder it just feels like you're flying and I still love to do that often and it's the closest thing to flying that I know but when I was around uh, 30, I was skiing up in Taos Ski Valley. And, um, you know, there was two feet of fresh snow, and I was skiing in an area where that, that hasn't, hadn't been skied much at all at that time. And before I knew it, I felt the whole mountain start moving with me. And all I realized immediately, I was in a, in a slide, you know, a small avalanche. And... The real complication was it was taking me right towards a cliff. And so I tried everything I could I could to stop. I tried to grab a tree. I tried to just brace my skis into the snow, and it just took me like I was just a little feather, you know, just floating on the surface of the snow and pushed me right off of this 40-foot cliff head first. And I remember thinking as I... I toppled head first uh, when I hit my skis, hit the rocks at the top of the cliff. I remember thinking, that's it. I'm done. I'm dead. And uh, and then I don't remember what happened for a while. And my first memory after that was 
sitting in the snow up to my neck at the bottom, you know, somewhere. I didn't know where I was at the time because I didn't remember what had happened for a little while. But I was sitting like in a like a chair of snow up to my neck, and just one of my friends was was talking to me. He's like, "Are you okay? Are you okay?" And and I slowly started to remember what had happened, and um, and I kind of scanned myself, and and I was and I was just couldn't believe I was alive. You know, I knew I had broken some bones. I felt like my wrist was broken and my back was definitely injured. And so I just sat there kind of stunned and dazed and, and amazed that I was still alive. And so anyway, they got me off the mountain and took a long time because of where I was. And, uh, I began the long, uh, process of recovering what turned out I had fractured a my T9 vertebra. And it wasn't a bad fracture, thankfully, because they didn't have to do surgery, but I was in pain for a long time. And, uh, you know, that as I kind of slowly came back into my body, I feel like I left my body for a while um, when that happened. And I just started to realize that, um, God, we could be, we could be gone any day. And every day was such a blessing to be alive. And that really, um, what really mattered was, was I living the way I really dreamed of and really wanted to. And, you know, I, I was for the most part, but I realized some of my dreams I hadn't been listening to anymore. And one of those dreams was flying. So as I recovered, I started researching, you know, hang gliders and just flying, just feeling this new enthusiasm and gratitude for being alive. And I started, and I found these, um, what we call trikes and it's basically like a hang glider wing on a, um, a hang glider style wing, but it's on a three wheeled carriage with a motor. So you can actually take off and land like an airplane. And as soon as I saw those, I thought that would be really cool. Cause you don't have to jump off a mountain. You can actually fly places and travel and you get to see everything from a totally unobstructed view with this, amazing wing over your head that you actually are controlling with your arms on the actual wing. So I would, so I did, I had, after that researching for a year or so and recovering, I um, started searching for a place where I could learn to, to do this and try to try it out and see if I liked it. And I found a flight school in Arizona and uh, really liked them on the phone and, and booked, booked a week um, of training with them. What kind of license do you get? So with this kind of a, actually, when I started back in 2002, you, if you, if you flew a single seater, you didn't need any license. Um, so you could just, but you had to learn from someone. You couldn't just get in one and try to learn by yourself, obviously. So to learn back then you had to have a exemption from the FAA to be an instructor or to, you had to, learn from someone who had that exemption and where they were labeled as a basic flight instructor. And so that's what I did. I went out there and uh, learned in a two seater. Um, and actually I had a similar experience the first couple of days as when I had flown when I was 13, it was very rough air and, and I started getting sick and I almost, I almost walked away and said, I can't do this, you know? And then the next couple of days later, I went out on an evening flight when it was smooth as glass and it was a beautiful sunset. The whole sky lit up. And that's when I realized, Oh, I don't have to fly when it's rough There's certain times of the day or certain days when it's smooth. And so then I, I decided right then and there, and I decided I liked it and I loved it and I wanted to buy one. And I actually had saved up money. So I bought a used trike there on that trip and came home with it and started flying as often as I could back here in New Mexico. That's it. Flying is, is certainly magical. Did you know that you wanted something that would be um, open to the air from the get go or did you consider a small plane or anything different? Well, I had flown in a small plane and I just felt kind of, kind of um, so separated from, from everything, you know, I was looking out a little window and, I really, I really knew for after I did that flight when I was 13 that I wanted to fly something open 
so I could really just be immersed in, in, in the sky and see everything below me and all around me and feel the air. And so that's really why I decided that this trike, you know, this powered hang glider would be the best, best thing that, that I could find to, um, to fly just out in the open and really kind of connect with everything. Well, it gives you amazing autonomy, being able to take off and land on your own and not be dependent on anybody else. Yeah. And you have a pretty good range. What about five or 600 miles? Uh, yeah, well, not quite. It depends on which wing you have on there. I have different speed wings, but I, I think with my faster wing, I can probably, probably go, look at a 400 mile range, depending on the winds, maybe, maybe more or less, depending on if you have a headwind or tailwind. But, Do you uh, usually try to fly in the morning or evening when the air is a little bit calmer? Yes. Yeah. I still, to this day, even after almost 20 years of flying, I don't like rough air. <laughs> so See, I come at it from the opposite perspective, flying sailplanes. I, I love rough air. I That's know. my energy. <laughs> I, know, I know you do. Well, I've actually gotten much more tolerant to it than I used to be. But still, if it's rough for a long period, I'm, I start getting, I start feeling queasy again. So so I try to fly early mornings. Like this morning, I took off before sun, around sunrise. And, and evenings in the winter, evenings are really nice. And sometimes in the summer, but usually summer evenings in New Mexico can be kind of rough too. So... A lot of the year I end up flying early mornings, um, you know, between half an hour before sunrise and, you know, two or three hours after sunrise. Where did the photography come into the picture? So after flying for, gosh, even after the first couple of flights, um, you, you're so blown away by what you see. It's just, especially from being on land your whole life and all of a sudden being up there and being in an open aircraft. You just you really, uh, your mind is blown and you just want to, sh- you want to share it with people. So, and I had had, you know, I dabbled in photography. I had a few cameras and I had done some photography, but um, it was just a natural thing. As soon as I started feeling comfortable up there, you know, after the first couple of weeks, I started bringing a camera with me and um, just every morning there was something new and beautiful to witness up there. And so, so it was pretty natural progression just to, to start wanting to take pictures. Your photography is beyond stunning. It's so beautiful. What sort of avenues has this opened up for you? Yeah, it's been an interesting road. You know, I've, um, you know, I, I really want to capture these things I'm seeing with, uh, with a camera that can really um, convey the feeling of the freedom you have and the landscapes you're seeing. So I kept getting, more powerful cameras, you know, first it was film because back then digital wasn't really that great. And so I went to medium format film, bigger film. And um, I was kind of limited by the, you know, amount of pictures you could take in a flight because I had to change film manually. And and so when I, when I, when digital actually got really good, um, I couldn't, you know, I, I had to switch over finally. It was so much easier to, to be able to take a thousand pictures on a flight instead of 35, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, do you bring multiple cameras and do you mount them somewhere or how do you manage that? Well, my main, my main still camera is around my neck so I can, I can fly and aim in any direction and shoot it and set up, do all the settings as I fly. I also have a few video cameras and I have a gimbal on the front that I use sometimes to do video, which is kind of a newer endeavor for me. But I also I've had GoPros and little you know little point of view cameras all over the all over the wing in different places for years and that's fun too. But uh, now I'm trying to really focus on getting high end um, video and as long as as well as high end stills while I'm flying. So the stills are all done with a camera around my neck and the, all the video stuff is from cameras that are mounted somewhere on the plane. What are the advantages of shooting from um, a platform like your trike versus drone photography? Well, I think the main advantage is just the joy you get out of actually being up there. Um, Of course, you get the other side of it, too. And some days, you you know, you have scary experience. But just to be up there and be immersed in it and shooting it while you're actually immersed in the subject that you're shooting is, I think, you can get angles that you wouldn't necessarily see from through a screen of a drone. 
And also you can go much further than a drone can. So you can cover two or 300 miles of beautiful terrain shooting pictures, whereas a drone is very limited to, you know, half an hour or something like that. What is, what was the, probably the scariest um, or one of the more frightening aerial situations you ever ran into? Well, as you know, um, the more you fly, the more chances <laughs> you, are, you have of having some scary experiences. Um, I would say they, probably the scariest one was having a, my engine die when I was, you know, flying over a mountain canyon and uh, having to land, you know, very unexpectedly and very quickly on a highway with traffic on it. Uh, that was, that was, oh, I bet that was interesting. <laughs> that was really scary. Um, you know, and I gotta say when that happened, that was kind of like the avalanche experience in a way, because I was so sh- shaken by it that I, I really like questioned everything I was doing and I, and wondered like, what do I really, why am I doing this? You know, what is motivating me to do this? And do I really want to, take this risk, you know? Um, and I, you know, I mulled it over and just stewed on it for a long time. And, and what I came up with is that I just, I really love what I'm doing and that if I can use that experience to do it safer and to, to really learn something that will keep me safer in the future, then that's what I wanted to do. And so that was another bump in the road, so to speak, that really, uh, that kind of, you know, takes you to the brink of, and makes you question everything in your life. And then, and then you can decide again, is this really what you want to do? And I, and I decided, yes, it was. I really, uh, I love just being up there and, and I love sharing this perspective with the world. And that's, I feel like for now, that's still what I want to do. Um, so is life in the air more real than life on the ground? Uh, you know, in some ways it is, in some ways it isn't. I'd say, it, I mean, some days it's hard to to come back to earth and like ground into just the whole, you know, the whole web of stuff we deal with down here, the onslaught of everything, you know, <laughs> media and just life and making a living and all that. Um, so it's more real in some ways because you really get a clear kind of view of what's important and and also just such a different connection with the planet that we're on you know and the way that it all interconnects with with itself and with us to support life here so it's it's more real in some ways but it also sometimes you come home and you're kind of spaced out because it's hard to want to to dive back into the muck on earth you know when when there's so much mundane seemingly mundane stuff to deal with so I think that I think one wouldn't be as good without the other, you know. Um, I wouldn't want to be in the air all the time, and, and I wouldn't want to be on land all the time either. So it's a good – they complement each other well. You have really just so many stunning pictures. Um, what are some of your favorites? Hmm, God, you know, this – God, the landscape in New Mexico and, and Colorado and Utah has just been – especially the last few years I've been flying into Utah and that, that is such an alien landscape that it's hard to even fathom that you're seeing it, you know, like flying over Monument Valley or some of these places. It's, you know, I, I mean, I love New Mexico and I love flying in this area and the mountains here are spectacular, but Utah is also just such an alien otherworldly place that that's kind of my lately, my, one of my favorite places to, to go explore and fly those, those places. Um, I love just packing up and going for, you know, a multi-day or week long flying trip with everything I need in in the trike and camping out. And to me, that's um, one of the most invigorating, exciting things that I know of at this point. What sort of advice would you give to somebody on following your passion? Um, you know, I think, um, I think you really, it's really important to follow your passion, but I think at the same time, you have to realize that you are, you are taking, putting yourself into a whole different world that, that involves risks and that it has to be taken really seriously and with lots of study and thought and practice and caution. 
um, because the weather is another big factor with a small plane, super light plane like this is learning to fly when the weather's safe for it. So I think it's, um, I would advise just to approach it slowly and really um, use your intuition and don't rush into anything. Don't feel like you have to be in a hurry with anything um, and let it just unfold naturally to where you feel comfortable and you feel empowered as you do this instead of feeling like you're pushing it and you're on the edge of, of danger where you, you know, you could be putting yourself at too much risk. So I think that's really at this, after this long of doing it, when I was younger, I was more just gung ho and jump right in and do it. Um, now I feel like it could be, you can do it really safely if you do it right. And, uh, that's kind of what I would advise. Just if you feel comfortable and you feel, energized by it then you're doing it right if you feel scared all the time and like you know you kind of cringe when you think about it then, <laughs> then you're doing something wrong you know? <laughs> so i think that's really it is um, just staying in tune with yourself and with the weather and with your aircraft is so important uh, in doing something like this i think flying really connects you to the to the earth and to the world in a way that few things do um i mean the energy of the sky the beauty it's just such an incredible experience. Um, what life lessons would you pass along from your time in the air? Hmm. Yeah, there's so many um, <clears throat> positive things I've taken from this, from these experiences. I think, I think really to see when you see how everything is so interconnected on the planet, and you see how we are so interconnected to all the systems of the planet to just to stay alive, you know, from the rain and the snow falling in, in the mountains and then running down into our fields and the valleys and, and our connection with the earth to be able to grow food and survive that way. And I think just really building connections with our natural world and, and with each other is really some of the life lessons that, that I've been learning is, you know, we're all in this together and the more we connect with people, especially different kinds of people who we wouldn't normally connect with, um, we kind of build little bridges or, you know, bonds between people that, that make us a little more understanding for, <clears throat> to, to each other and to other people of different walks of life. And I think those kind of connections are really important as we move forward because we're really, we really need to connect in an, on a more global scale. If we want to keep life at, you know, life, healthy life on earth going, um, I feel like we're at a point where, you know, we've lived in a disconnected way with our society and with each other and that it's not serving us. And the more we can, kind of build those connections again we can learn how to thrive in harmony with each other and with the earth in a way that's that's sustainable Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life's path, because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life. You can subscribe to our free podcast at www.bumpintheroad.us or become a premium member to hear the full conversation. Just go to www.bumpintheroad.us for more information and to sign up.